You're listening to a podcast by Oak Magazine. I would like to acknowledge the Dja Dja Wurrung people as the traditional owners of the land on which this episode was recorded. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Welcome to A Friend of Mine, a series of conversations with some incredible and inspiring women in business from regional and rural Australia. I'm Kimberly Finesse, your host and the founder and editor of Oak Magazine. And I cannot wait to introduce you to some amazing female entrepreneurs who will share with you their experience and knowledge of what it takes to start, grow and scale a successful business. So let me introduce you to a friend of mine. Erica McInerney is the OG of social media marketing, having laid the foundations of her business, Mac and Ernie, in 2015, before officially launching in early 2016. In only four months, the demand was there for her to quit her part-time job and work in the business full-time. Erica has been working in advertising and digital marketing for over 25 years and shares that practical experience and knowledge freely. Based in Warrigal, Erica is well known for her generosity and authenticity and provides training that is smart, relevant, and most importantly, jargon free. Erica shares with us her startup journey, tips on improving your Instagram, and answers lots of those popular social media questions like, how often should I be posting? And I'm already booked out, do I really need to post on Instagram? Meet my friend Erica from Mac and Ernie. Hello, Erica, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, Look, I've actually known you for quite some time. From a social media perspective, we've not really had the chance to, to meet in person as such, but I've certainly followed your business journey. And I would have to say that you've really owned the space of social media management and training for so long. Well, that's very kind of you to say. I've um, been doing it since early 2016. So, I mean, it has been a while, I guess, as far as um, businesses go. <laughs> but I guess the social media space hasn't really been that, from a business marketing um, perspective, it hasn't really been around for that long, even though it feels like it's always been here. Yeah, definitely. I think it's your branding as well, Erica, that's quite strong and memorable. And, and maybe the fact that you always showed up with your face, if that makes sense. So it was, I knew who was behind the brand. I think if it had been a little different and it was just, you know, your branding, your logo and all that, that I always saw, you know, maybe that connection wouldn't have been forged, but because I saw your face all the time, like, I, I feel like I know you. Yeah. It's funny. Um, a lot of people, if I run into people in shops and stuff, they'll come up and start talking to me. <laughs> and I always have this moment where I think, I don't know who this person is. I don't know who this person is. And they say, oh, you probably don't know me actually, but I follow you on social media. And I just, I get this really sort of instant, oh, thank God, because, um, but it is my face. I don't know if that's a good thing, but I do, um, I do always have my face in there and I do um, encourage people to do that if if they are uh, as much in the business as as I am I mean my business is it's all me um it's all it's all this so yeah if I I have to show my face yeah well why don't we go back a bit rewind and tell me the backstory of Mac and Ernie your business how did you how did you start it well um it's it's, it's not a particularly exciting story, I like to say, but it's a bit of a roundabout one. I worked in um, advertising for, I think I'd been working in advertising for about 15, 16 years in Melbourne. And um, my husband and I um, started a family. So I had a new baby and I was working as a general manager in an agency. And, um, and I just really lost the, I lost the drive a bit. I always loved it. And, um, but you know, what it's like having a, a little baby, your priorities change. And so we started thinking about um, what we could do, um, what I could do that's different to allow me to be able to be a bit more home. And, um, and we ended up deciding to move to Warrigal. So we moved to a regional town that's about 
um, an hour, hour and a half out of Melbourne, depending on the traffic. And um, so when I got here, we then had another baby and, and I was very much sort of like, oh, I don't, I don't really want to get back into advertising. What am I going to do? So um, I started a working on uh, developing a farmer's market with another friend in a mother's group that I was in. And we launched that in 2013 and it was amazing. Still, it's a, it's a fantastic um, farmer's market. And um, we got some funding and, of course, that funding didn't stretch to marketing and promotion. So I learned to really embrace Facebook and then later on Instagram um, just for the, the opportunity that it presented for the market to drive people to the market. Um, but also really to drive sales for the stallholders as well. Um, and then at that stage, I was also working part-time in marketing and really leaning into that social media space. Um, and so I had a lot of stallholders and local small business owners reaching out to me, can I buy your coffee? Can you help me get set up on Facebook? Uh, just all the time people calling me, which was, which is nice. And I love helping people, um, but then in about um, sort of towards the end of 2015, I think it was, I started to put together some ideas for some training and some workshops that I could run potentially through um, this library corporation that I was working for. And then I thought, well, actually, why don't I just do this myself? And so I started to work on um, what would then become McInerney um, and I sort of hit I think it was the end of February I'd been thinking and planning and then I just one night I was sitting on the couch and I said I'm just going to announce this on Facebook on my own personal account and I'm going to tell everyone that I'm doing this thing because if I don't I'm never going to do it I'm just going to talk about it so I did that and then I was like right pressure's on um get the logo get the business name do the you know do it all and yeah and I started um yeah, started working on, in the business in early March and then I had to quit my job, um, my part-time job. Um, by um, about July, I was full-time in the business um, by July that year. So it was super quick. It's incredible. Was there people around you that had businesses as well? Like how did you know where to find all this information? Do you know what I mean? It's not something that comes intuitively to us uh, unless we Google, but even then it's a minefield. Yeah, like I've got, uh, I've got lots of friends um, who have small businesses, which is another um, kind of cool thing about being in a regional town is um, you do kind of connect with local business owners a little bit more, I think, um, because you build relationships with them outside of that business. So um, where was I finding my information? Um, probably Googled, had a look at, um, you know, bus all the business registration stuff. My husband works, um, he's a marketing and comms manager as well. And so he was really helpful. He set up my first website and was really supportive of, you know, um, work like sort of walking through all the domain stuff and registration. And, um, and I found a really good accountant straight away and started working with them because um, I converted to a company in um, 2018 and so they were really really helpful um, going through that process as well so yeah yeah just... I think if I could go back and do everything again one thing I'd do differently is get a bookkeeper or mm. an accountant on right at the very start it's so yeah. hard to catch back up if that makes sense mm. or or undo what you've done or you sometimes you just keep finding an excuse which is where I've been you know at times of my businesses is I'll just wait till the next financial year let me get this one done and let me tidy everything up um you know so I can hand it over to you all nice and neat like yeah. it's like inviting someone over and going yeah. okay I need to clean the house uh so that yeah <laughs> So that we can make a mess again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, in terms of being able to step into your business full time in such a short period, what was it? Was it demand or and was it pricing yourself right? It was definitely not. Well, I was pricing myself right. I was pricing myself um, really cheaply, uh, which was one of the things I had to change. Um, demand was there. Um I 
I did find that the business model, kind of the idea that I'd had was going to be doing um, workshops, so that one to many. And then um, sort of quickly on I identified that actually this stuff is really personal and um, and people really struggle with it. So, you know, this idea of confidence and skills building sometimes is not great in a in a workshop so I found a lot of people were actually asking me to do one-on-one sessions and that's what I was pricing really low um, which in retrospect wasn't great but at the same time I was getting um, uh, getting asked to, to build like custom workshops so um, yeah, healthcare groups and local councils and business groups and um, people like that were asking me to develop workshops for them that they could invite their um, staff or community or group to. So I was still doing those workshops, but I was doing a lot of one on ones and um, and I was also I also took on a couple of um, sort of larger projects. So from time to time, if there's something that really interests me, I'll take on like a strategy or something like that. So um, I just found that I could not do both anymore. And I had to, yeah, I just had to make that decision um, to change. So yeah, lots of working one-on-one, which I love. Um, it's also really time consuming. So mm. well, I was going to say keeping on top of all the changes uh, that happen on social media and probably more so now than ever. I think Instagram's probably, you know, one of the fastest changing platforms for us as social media trainers. You know, that's in itself is a full-time job, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you would know. Um, sometimes it really, you can be as prepared as you think, but sometimes they really catch you off guard because they'll just launch um, a huge feature that, nobody's um nobody's across nobody's heard any rumors about and it's sort of all of a sudden it's just like right this is here (laughs) and um and then we just have to scramble a little bit um but I um I kind of actually just really enjoy it I, I enjoy that I'm always learning learning's you know um and studying's always been something that I do and so um so keeping on top of that stuff um is fun for me and one of the things that I, I really enjoy about it is is learning about it but then um, I guess translating it into regular person speak and that's where I really feel like I can make a difference to people because it's all well and good for Instagram to launch a new thing uh, but what does that mean? What does that mean to a business owner? How can you use it? How, is, how are other people going to use it? That, that's the kind of stuff that I think people really need. So that's your superpower is, yeah. yeah maybe. That, absolutely. Take, taking that. the jargon out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I just had a workshop in Redcliffs, which is just outside of Mildura. And on the Friday, it's a two-day one. And on the Friday, we we're going to be talking about stories and reels. Um, so it's usually the part where we lose most of <laughs> the attendees like you know day one's already enough um and then you're going to go into stories and reels and insta literally just dropped all these new features on reels and it's like my workbook's out of date and it was printed three days ago like this is just crazy um but what I probably would love to ask, because I know that I've discovered you on Facebook um that's probably where you know I first saw you pop up and now we're obviously moving a lot more into Instagram, I find. I find that's sort of the platform that everyone wants to learn more about. And it's incredible because you think that everyone would know enough, but it's so funny. There's just all these pockets of people. What's your favourite? Like do you still lean back to old school fave Facebook or you're more leaning towards Insta these days? Um, probably the last few years I've been um, really putting – most of my time and energy into Instagram. Um, But in recent times, um, I have started to sort of circle back to Facebook. Um, And, and I've noticed that when you put love and energy and effort into Facebook, uh, the rewards can be much higher. Um, I still like, I mean, in terms of favorites, I I, st- I really want to still love Instagram because I love, I just really, but it's really driving me mad at the moment and um, and it's really frustrating people and I think that um, the, 
there's been a fundamental change with Instagram that I'm not quite loving, and that is this um, this this move to becoming an entertainment channel rather than um, rather than what it was. It's very much focused on entertainment, and I think. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I love it as much. So I've actually, been um, tiptoeing back, creeping back into LinkedIn a lot more. Like, hey guys, sorry, I, I haven't been here for a while. Um, yeah. So yeah, don't know. Don't know who my favorite is at the moment, but I, I am enjoying my conversations on LinkedIn, and I'm enjoying Facebook and Facebook groups and stuff as well. Yeah. I intentionally didn't mention LinkedIn because uh, <laughs> I think it's such an easy favorite. Um, those that aren't on LinkedIn, my gosh, you need to be. There are so many reasons why just in terms of even Google being able to find you and building your personal brand. It's not even about, you know, um, job hunting anymore. It, as you said, it's got some really good conversations. Um, yeah, it's a platform I love. I still don't feel co- as comfortable on there as I do on Instagram. And I wonder if it's because I've got the brand sort of buffering my ideas and my thoughts whereas I think LinkedIn is is just yourself so Mm. yeah yeah yeah, I can see that and and I think to you know algorithms whatever sometimes you post on LinkedIn and you think I've got something really good to say about this and then it's just crickets and (laughs) that that is that can be really hard for people to deal with but then another time you can say something about something really random or stupid and everybody jumps on it and um yeah and you're not buffered yeah you don't have um anything to hide behind Uh, it's good though one of um facebook's features like on our personal profiles is the memories i don't know if you Mm -hmm. do you look at your memories love it and do you look at like you know i'm talking like 15 years ago your memories and where you just write like really random little one sentence strings like no images nothing like that and you'd probably would have got, you know, three or four likes on it, but it wouldn't have mattered. Like back then I can, I know that it didn't matter how many people liked my content. I got onto Facebook in July, um, 2007 and, um, and my daughter was born in September 2009 and it amazes me sometimes when my Facebook memories pop up of me being pregnant or new baby and and there'll be like 10 likes or 20 likes and I just think, oh. And then I think, well, that's because no one was on it, you know, half my family, most of my friends, like nobody was really using it like that. And I, and I remember it used to have that prompt, um, tell me what you're thinking about or what are you thinking about? And so that's what people would do. They go, oh, it's so cold today. I know. And then they'd be like two likes. <laughs> yeah, just, oh, just, how times have changed. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, like all of these things, they've become such an important part of our lives and part of our the way that we communicate with each other um, that it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't see a way out of it. I think, you know, a lot of people... Um, are trying to get off social media and, and quit Facebook and, and doing all of these things. And I just think, apart from the fact that it's my job and I could never quit Facebook, um, I just think I feel like I'd be missing out on too much. Yeah. I think there's the very, like when I'm doing workshops, you, you do get a lot of people that say, oh, I, I, I hate Facebook. And it's like, you know, and I'm not on it and I don't want to share. And it's like, well, I've got a very closed down personal Facebook page. You know, I, I don't share much at all. Um, and if I do these days, it's actually more about Oak. I think the community of Oak would probably know more about what's happening in my life than what my personal Facebook page. And I think that's the thing, Erica, you've got to, you've got to separate them. They're very, very different to using social media for personal and, and using it for our businesses. Why do you think it's so important for us to have social media for our business, especially as a regional and rural business? That's a good question. Um, I think that it's what people forget often about these tools is that they are search engines. They're very powerful search engines and they're very um, well-used search engines. So if you want to be found 
uh, in the same way that you, you want your website to be found when somebody's on Google, um, then you, you kind of have to be there now. You don't necessarily have to post all the time. You don't have to try to grow your audience and all of those things. But I think that, you know, you, you really do need to be there to, to be found. Uh, I was actually just talking to someone earlier today about this and uh, she hadn't posted on Facebook since um, late December last year. And I said, you know, given everything that's been happening, that's a really dangerous thing to do because then so many businesses closed down, so many um, so many things happened that if you haven't posted for six months, then if somebody finds you on Facebook, the, the quite logical conclusion to draw is, oh, they they're not there anymore. So, um, yeah, I, I, there's lots of reasons why you should be on social media as a business, um, but there's also lots of reasons why you shouldn't make it um, the biggest priority in your business. There's lots of reasons why you should learn how to do it strategically and effectively so that you're not just slapping up stuff or stressing about it or spending too much time looking at what your competitors are doing. Um, yeah, as you know, like there's, there's, there's ways to do this, um, well, and, and then there's ways to do it in a way that makes you really hate the space. Like it, I can see why people hate using Facebook and don't want to use it. But, um, when you see how it can work for you, it's a no brainer for me. So, mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, let's do some myth busting. Some of the common questions that I hear all the time, I'm going to throw to you. Um, and one of them is, I'm already booked out. I'm already busy. Why do I need to be using it? <laughs> I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> all right. um, well, I mean, look, you, if you're already booked out and you're not um, trying to get more sales, then actually it's a really nice place to nurture uh, your uh, potential customers or your current customers or clients, I guess, if you're booked out. Um, and so, so by not showing up, you're not um, making sure that future you is booked out. You know, people talk about pipelines and sales funnels and all of that stuff. And um, But if you think about it as connection and nurturing and conversations and being top of mind and brand awareness and all of those nice things that you can do using social media, um, then you can use it for that. You don't have to go book now or um, you, you can tell people that you're not available now, but, um, you know, here's something else instead. I, I personally use social media not as a sales tool. I use it um, one of the kind of, I guess, content pillars or one of the values of my business is knowledge and knowledge sharing and community. And so I use it to give tips and give advice and to provide, uh, I guess, a a free service to people, um, not necessarily to, uh, I don't stress too much about whether or not that leads to a, a, a sale or a booking. So there's different ways to use it. Mm, absolutely. Um, I use Oak to build community. As you said, mine's not a sales funnel by yeah. any means. I think I probably make other people money by posting about their business. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's all about building community. Just back to that question as well, Erica. I mean, hopefully we don't ever have something like a global pandemic again in the next, like in our generation. Surely we are not that <laughs> unlucky. But, you know, I think that was probably the thing. A lot of businesses, maybe they were booked out. And they didn't need the business. But then when we have something just flip everything on its head, mm. you actually did need social media because you needed to pivot. And if you haven't got that engaged audience, where do you go from? Like there's yeah. nowhere to build. You've got to build, you know, you've got to put down your base first and, you know, start building, whereas other people already had their their beautiful online bricks and mortar chugging away, doing what it needed to. They did and that's why um, actually those those sort of lockdown years were um, insane, absolutely insane for my business because so many people just kind of went, oh, what am I going to do? Um, and so, yeah, like even if you're just posting once a week or just, you know, I, I hate this phrase, but just showing up Um and, um, and, and keeping people engaged is, it's such a great 
I, I find um, social media, social networks, um, such a great place for connection. I mean, look, we're, yeah. we're doing it right now. We've done it. And, um, and you should never let that, yeah, you should never kind of let that ongoing stuff slide just because you're busy because yeah. sometimes when you get to the end of those of those busy months uh you're looking at a at empty books and then you've got yeah. to really um pedal hard yeah or maybe even when you need to ask your community for something and it might not be for yourself maybe it is to yeah. support another business or a charity or something again that whole engaged online community is so hard to build um mm. but once you've got it I think it's easier to maintain um yeah and I suppose that you've just mentioned another one I thought I'd, I'd throw at you how often should I post a week that's the other <laughs> how often yeah how much is too much <laughs> don't ask me that well I don't know I think everyone's very different I think it comes down to um how often can you post something that is valuable, <laughs> interesting, entertaining, whatever it is? Um, if you're just posting every day um, to a small audience is uh, definitely not a good idea. Um, if you've got a huge audience, then, you know, posting more often um, can help to, you know, to make sure that you are actually reaching uh, more, more people in that audience. But it's a like it's a really general question that I, I I don't know I don't know the answer to and I think um, dealing in those kind of um, one size fits all yeah it's not and not I think that's what they're looking for isn't it is that mm -hmm. what is this magic recipe that I need what time should I post do I should I, if I post video will will that work everybody has this unique audience and the the, the kind of fascinating thing about these social networks is they use these algorithms that are like artificial they are artificial intelligent they're constantly learning and changing and uh, and so yeah it's something that you do this week won't work next week and um and the way that people are using um social media is is changing all the time and yeah there's so many things at play and um unfortunately there's just no kind of set and forget program with this stuff no not anymore no I think um the ones that sort of came earlier on were probably able to get away with that but not anymore and um look I think if you it's consistency isn't it if you know yeah. that you can show up consistently once a week just do that you know and then use stories to fill in the other days um mm -hmm. I, you know they still count as content sometimes I spend far too long on a 15 second piece of content like incredibly <laughs> that just goes you know pfft, up somewhere goes somewhere <laughs> and then disappears again no it is look all of those places and somewhere like instagram um you should be yeah you should be appearing in all of those places yeah. regularly consistently but not every you know it doesn't have to be every day that that regularity that consistency is is entirely up to you and what you can achieve with your time are you always stressing and guessing when it comes to your social media marketing? Do you feel like your effort doesn't bring the results you need or you don't know how to check? Well, you need to check out my friend Mac and Ernie. Erica Mac and Ernie is a qualified marketing strategist with 25 years real experience, putting advertising, marketing and social media to work. She's focused on regional and rural businesses, teaching you the skills and confidence to develop strategy, measure results and keep that content machine running. For free tips, follow Mac and Ernie on social media or head to macandernie.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. I feel like most of our audience is on Instagram. Um, that's obviously where I have the biggest audience for myself. Um, even though when I look at my social, oh, my website stats, uh, it was something like, oh, it was insane actually, like 87% of my website traffic for the last seven days was from Facebook. Um, you know, you've always got it. You've got to look at the data. I think that's I our do. probably both of us. Our number one tip is look at those insights, whether they're your website um, and if you don't have access to that because I know many small businesses don't or, or don't understand how to find that um, you know otherwise just your Instagram insights if you're on a business account are just full of 
goodness. They'll tell you what posts are performing well. All you need to do is rinse and repeat. Um, but um, if we focus on Instagram, Erica, what would you? What would some tips be for you? Like, what could someone pick up their phone right now and and look at to improve? Um, I would say number one would um, would always make sure that you're putting your customers and clients first. That you're speaking um, to them and uh, and to their needs and their interests and their behaviours, rather than just um, kind of I guess selling at them or talking at them. Uh, ask yourself, you know, who am I talking to? What do they need? What do they want? What problem am I solving? And and speak to that. Um, and one really great way to um, to work out how to do that is to look at things like what are people asking you all the time? Because if they're asking you questions, you, you're clearly not um, being um, clear. <laughs> you're clearly not being clear uh, about that particular topic. Um. I think um, always remembering that um, Instagram is a social network, which sort of follows on from what I said before. It's um, people are in their uh, in their personal time, and they're there for connection. And so, don't forget about um, driving connection within the platform. Um, don't necessarily use something like Instagram Stories to send people off to your website because that's actually really hard to do. And same with posts or wherever you're posting, actually getting someone to leave Instagram and go to your website is hard. So don't fall into the trap of saying, um, please get in touch uh, and then putting a link to your website, to your content uh, contact page. Actually just go send me a message, get in touch. And how like- many, sorry, how many people, hmm. uh, this kills me when I look at a bio, Erica, and it says, please no DMs. I'm like, oh, I what know. are you doing on this platform? Like this this is the whole, this is where it's all based. Yeah. I, I could be it, actually contacting you for a front cover of a Vogue magazine or something one day, yeah. you know, no DMs. It's crazy. Mm. And um, and that sort of just, that describe. yeah, I guess it depends on how you want to use it. And I know that people are busy. Like I'm, I'm always in um, training sessions and so I can't answer my DMs immediately so I make sure that I've got an automatic response and some frequently asked questions and stuff like that so that I'm setting the expectation for people but connect with them in the platform that they're in I guess is my tip be in Instagram show up in all the places too some people now you used to just go to Instagram and go I just scroll the feed for five minutes now you go I've got five minutes I'm going to look at reels or I'm going to just check up on what people are doing in stories the, the feed is is kind of fractured now. There's people that you're following. There's your favourites. There's Reels feed. There's a Stories feed. That you might go in and check your messages. Uh, you might be in some little groups and things. So um, make sure that you are um, in, in all of those places so that you can be both found by your existing audience but also be found by, um, by new people. Mm. And just that engagement piece, I think, is really important as well, isn't it? As you said, it's a social network, so it's not about just posting. I think the best value comes from going to other people's content and liking it and leaving a comment, um, you know, replying to stories that you see in your feed. Um, I know that as a small business owner, that feels anytime you get any engagement, you know, someone reaching out, it just you get a little spark inside you. It, feel, it makes you feel great. It's great for the algorithm. Um, and as I said, it's that building community part, isn't it? Like it's it's making friends, standing is, in a coffee shop talking to people. Yeah, it is. And, I, and that is the one thing that I just really truly love about Instagram is all of the people that I've met that I have regular conversations with that I've never actually yeah. met. <laughs> and in life, yeah. Them, <laughs> yeah, I would I'd be like, yeah, they're my friend. Um, but, yeah, I think I think we just – when you're using it as a business, the temptation is to think of it as just um, as just like a business tool, and and that's only about a third of the possibility. It, yes, it absolutely is a place where you can advertise your products and services, hundred percent. But um, but you're only using it 
like a fraction of its capacity, um, the, the capacity that it has to grow networks and collaborations and raise brand awareness and make you feel good and um, inspire you. And, you know, there's a lot of positive stuff about um, about something like Instagram. And I, and I know that there's in balance, there's, there's a lot of negative stuff as well. You know, there's the ability to dwell on what your competitors are doing. There's um, there's hours and hours that can be lost um, scrolling reels and feeling inadequate and all of that stuff. Like I know that that's all there, but, um, you know, I always try to teach people to just be um, strategic about it and, and, and build structure around um, what it is that you do in Instagram so that you've got time for fun and nice stuff and, and less time to... Um, on, uh, I guess, more sort of toxic behaviour. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, hashtags. It's always hashtags. the one that trips people up, isn't it? It's crazy. Um, yeah. You know, or just not using them. Uh, so hashtags, are they important and why? Uh, yeah, they're important. You know they're important. They are important. So uh, a little while back, um, Instagram finally switched to a search engine, a keyword search engine. So before... Um, we couldn't search things um, via words and captions. I, I think the thing with hashtags that people need to remember is that they're a way to search and they're a way to be found. And um, if you don't, if you use them properly and think and really think about what are people searching for in order to find what it is that I've got, uh, they can work really well for you. The algorithms are super smart now with hashtags and they can tell that your hashtags don't match your caption or your creative. So gone are the days where you would just put, you know, random hashtags in there uh, to try to drive, you know, new traffic to you. Um, these days it's more important to be, um, thankfully, uh, authentic and genuine and, um, you know, think about what, what value you represent and what people might be searching for in order to find you. So I, I would say with your hashtags, just where are you? Is place important? Um, what's the post about? Um, and um, and then maybe, um, you know, drive some people to you for a, a purpose or a reason that they might be looking for. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have this great little story that I tell in the workshops and um, – it's about having gone to Mildura. It was about five or six years ago to do social media workshops. And I mean, coffee is life to me. Like yeah. <laughs> my whole, <laughs> my whole day just circles around it and um, good quality coffee too, I have to say. And anyway, um, I always search, you know, hashtag, you know, Mildura cafe or Mildura coffee. That is how I search for my coffee place. And anyway, I did that and up came obviously the search results and I look for a good photo of a coffee. Now, there's no rhyme or reason, Erica, but I find if you can take a good photo of a coffee, it's got to taste good. <laughs> so far, so good. Anyway, um, yeah, I clicked on one. I then went to their bio. It said they were open. It had everything I needed in there. It had a story on there as well. You know, their photography was sort of high end, which was great. Um, and it's called Black Milk Specialty Coffee. Uh, I've not cheated on them yet uh, since going in the last five years. Um, and it was so good. I was even there obviously last week and popped in and um, like they make me feel like a regular even though I am a visitor and I think I love that feeling and obviously they must follow me because they say, oh, you're back here, you know, doing workshops again, are you? I obviously drink a lot of coffee. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I've been to other little towns lately. Uh, Red Cliffs was one of them, you know, uh, Moulamin, Bort, Barham, Kundrook. Some of those towns, I mean, they're not too big and it, it is pretty easy to find the only cafe. But, you know, that's how I search and I don't think I'm alone. I think a lot of people use hashtags, as you said, for for their, for exploring a, a new town or um, a new place and where to stay, shop, eat, drink, explore. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's also too for that reason that um, – that I really encourage people, and it's I'm not talking about Instagram now, but to um, make sure they've got a Google business listing so that they appear on maps. And for the same purpose, people um, people come to a new place and and they're looking they're looking to see what's going on. If you're not using your location um, 
in Instagram and you're not using your location stickers in stories, then you're not going to just pop up to random people who are like, oh, yeah, well, I'm in Mildura. What's going on? Hit the Mildura story and and start going. If you're not there, you're not there. And um, I'm, I'm in exactly the same as you whenever I'm um, traveling. I always look for a good looking, <coughs> a good looking coffee. And, and then I go and have a look at their audience and I think, oh, well, this is a pretty small town and they've got, you know, 1,200 people following them, so they must be good. And, you know, I have a look at their reviews. You, you do all of these things because you don't want to make, um, you don't want to make a bad coffee mistake. No, it just ruins your whole. <laughs> and I'm drinking soy milk at the moment. So, you know, that's a little bit hit and miss. Um, and usually you'll have a particular soy that you like. But um, look, I'd actually have to shout out Orange, uh, it's Geo Origins uh, in Redcliffs. I just actually found it on my way out. I was driving home. Okay. And um, yeah, they were on the, they're in this old service station that obviously had been renoed into a coffee spot. And the great thing, again, there's high vis everywhere. And I'm like, okay, they look busy. I'll go in. We'll see how this goes. Um, but my gosh, the music was pumping. There was such an energy. The guy's making coffee, but could see I was waiting next. He says, oh, you know, what do you need? And I'm like, oh, soy latte. And then by the time I got to the front, the girl already knew, like she'd heard. And it's like, oh my God, this hospitality yeah. is incredible. Um, and the coffee, amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I should have got a bigger one. <laughs> It's obviously you a, need a coffee. Drive-by. It sounds to me like you need a coffee. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I've, as you know, Erica, I've bought the podcast van. I may just need to put a coffee machine in the back. If I could absolutely. start another business, that's what it would be. Do you yeah. have that? Like, is there another oh my business God, no, that you would like that. to do? No? Um, uh, look, I actually did almost start a, a, a business like that um, and I'm pretty glad I didn't because um, – yeah, just, it's just been a crazy few years. Um, I, you know, from time to time I do kick the tyres on what would I do. And um, my um, mum my actually, who I, I forgot I should have credited before, my mum actually used to teach um, small business startups, <laughs> just randomly, and she's a good source of um, uh, inspiration for me. So sometimes I'll go and I'll, I'll talk to her about stuff and then she'll say things to me like, but why would you do that when you've got a perfectly successful business and you don't really have any overheads and, you know, (laughs) she says all this stuff to me and I go, yeah, that's true. That is true. So I don't know. Do you have um, an end game then? I do. I do have a bit of an end game, um, but I'm, well, not an end game. I mean, I'm 47, so I'm not that young. Um, but I do have, I do actually have some, um, some plans, which I'm not going to talk about. Oh, no, no. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, for just, yeah, for, just, for some changes. Like my kids are um, 10 and 12 at the moment. And um, so I'm starting to be able to think about, you know, like I, I this business um, is, I, I, love it for its flexibility and for my ability to be able to drive my kids, pick my kids up, take them to activities, help them with stuff. Like it's, it really is um, a a family oriented business. Um, But, you know, I'm starting to see opportunities, you know, a few years down the track um, as they get more and more independent. Um, How does that change what I do? Um, Yeah. So I'm always kind of thinking about stuff. Okay. A couple of weeks ago, I was at an event in Melbourne. Um, it was run by a Melbourne Innovation Centre. Um, and it's part of their digital program that they obviously roll out throughout the year. It was a big grand finale and they had Naomi Simpson. And she was talking a lot about the end game. Um, you know, know how you're going to wrap up your business or how you're going to step out of it. Um, and it was just so interesting that I then had conversations with other people uh, during that following week about them saying, you know, I've done the freelancer thing Um yeah, COVID was pretty tricky and pretty hard and a bit of a wake up call. I've actually stepped back into a corporate role. Like I need to start thinking of my super and um, yeah, maybe working smarter and not harder. Because obviously business ownership is, I think, incredibly time consuming and can be stressful. Um, So yeah, it was just really interesting that there are women who are probably that mid 40s, sort of early 50s that have been in business or freelancers and are starting to, yeah, think about 
what's next? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a mentor on that program. Yeah. The ASPAS. Yeah. 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 It's the only I'm acronym I can ever remember. Aspas. <laughs> Aspas. Yeah. I, I didn't, didn't make it to that. I couldn't make it to that event, but I wish I had gone. And, um, and it is true. I, one of the things that I'm sort of always talking to people about is people have great ideas, really great ideas and are doing really like really great things. And I, I kind of say, well, how are you going to make money from that? Or uh, particularly when it comes to things like social media and um, stuff, how are you going to monetize that? How are you going to make sure that that it's sustainable? And they go, oh, but it's just, I want to do it to help people. I go, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I like it. But, you know, you, you do have to sort of think um, a lot of, if you're if you're home with a baby right now, and and this is a bit of a side hustle, for want of a better word, um, what's next? How how can you um, how can you sort of scale or how can you make it different? You know, there's some things that I wish that I had done when I started this, and one of those things is I wish that I had prepared to succeed instead of going with that um, common kind of feeling of, oh, well, I'll just do this thing and um, hopefully it'll work out. I think that planning for success allows you to put in place systems and, um, you know, like just plans. You know, you talked before about getting a good bookkeeper. That first two years of my business went so quickly and it was so crazy and a lot of that time, I was retrofitting just stuff and yeah, like just trying to work out how to, what do they call it? It's like building the plane on the way down or building a parachute on the way down or I don't know, something. There's, there's a saying there that I've forgotten. So um, yeah, thinking, thinking about the future of the business is important. Someone said to me um, a few years ago, so Mac and Ernie, um, my surname is Mac and Ernie. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's really cute. No one else is going to have that name and, and all the rest. But, you know, when you name a business after yourself, uh, it means that um, it's always going to be about you. And uh, so when people come to me and they're starting up like a physiotherapy clinic or like an allied health sort of clinic or something like that, and they go, oh, well, it's just me. And so I want to call it the John Smith um physiotherapy I go well don't do that because if you have future plans to hire other like a myotherapist or a masseuse or and have other people in the business who might be running their businesses out of your clinic they don't want to work under your name so yeah I I don't know I'm always trying to encourage people to think a few steps ahead and I feel like I've just gone really way off topic there no, that was great. I love it. It's such good advice. Um, it's just that growth mindset. And I think, as you said, we probably do go in with that, um, I want to say small mind mentality in that. I want to say imposter syndrome. Oh, the even women. even that. Well, I didn't want to make it a, a gendered thing. And that's usually so me. I'm like, it's just a female thing. But I think yeah. it is, you know, I, again, I was um, a guest speaker last week at an event and the guy went before me. Now, this is not normal for me. Usually I go to women events, women in business events. So obviously the panel is, is pretty much hundred percent female. Uh, and this was sort of the first time and the guy went before me and it was so interesting to sit back and listen to how he sold himself to how he said to everyone, you know, I'm number one on this. I do this and I'm great at that. And people send me this. And, um, I must admit I was sitting there and I had my notes and I'm like, delete okay where am I gonna (laughs) I'm awesome too (laughs) yeah I'm gonna start again and and talk myself up a bit more and um you know it's just something that we do I think you know you you know that tall poppy syndrome isn't it you don't want to I don't know or set yourself up for failure maybe is it you know I think okay I'm gonna have this big business and then it I don't know and it's not that it might not work it's just that fear that it might not I think planning for success planning for success um is good and it's a good reason to talk to someone really early in your business as well because as soon as you start talking to someone like a business coach or a mentor or someone as soon as you start talking to other people you get out of your own head and and you allow people to look at your business from um an external um, point of view i um was working um with 
Amy um, Summers from who's a business coach um, sort of early in my business uh, probably like in the second year maybe and it was so so instrumental in my um, in my success I think because I was exhausted and um, and there were there were a lot of things that were that were playing out in my head that weren't real and yeah just like some she really helped me to sort of define what it is that I wanted to do and what my values were and who I wanted to work with because I'd I'd been working with people that um, I didn't want to work with and you You say yes to everything at the start you know yeah yeah so I think if you can find someone even if even if it's not a even if you don't have the funds to pay someone if you can find someone to just just talk to that's not you um, so important yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's the last year I've had my business coach, which is Chris from Make It In Media. And that has just been a game changer. Honestly, it's things like thinking of, okay, I'll bring on a certain role. Um, and she'll ask those hard questions. Have you done the numbers? You know, let's open the spreadsheet now and, and put in some yep forecasting to see what that looks like and um you know I'll say oh I'd love to go and do this and she said well actually you know pitch it as a collaboration they should be just yeah as you said it's that outside in and when you're working on your own all Mm. the time um yeah it's good to have that person to say hey this is (laughs) this is what's I don't Mm. know what to do yeah I'm in a circle at the moment can you help me find some structure to this yeah and and social media just bring it back to social media um that's that's another one of those ways that another one of those places that you can connect with these people and and if if these people that you want to connect with give enough of themselves on social media that it builds that that trust and i know you would have heard and everyone would have heard that like no trust um, if you if you hold back your your real self um, from social media, you're losing the ability to connect and to build that. You know, I like that person. I, I know what they talk about. I kind of I know what they're like because I I've been following them for a while. And and then you get to the that that level of trust where they actually trust you to um, coach them or mentor them or whatever it is that you do. Um, I think that whilst it can be really confronting and really hard to, um, to, to show to keep showing yourself in that space, it, the value is so high. Um, mm. What excites you about the future of your work, of your business? I think, um, there's a lot of opportunity um for me right now i've been doing um this for six and a half years or something and um and so i'm i'm finding myself being pulled in um in different directions at the moment i'm doing a lot of uh i guess bigger projects and strategy and stuff which i find exciting um i think that the frustrations of um, the now of of social media right now, um, and that doesn't excite me. Um, but I do feel like um, there's a there's a lot of opportunity to um, to really help people at the moment, which I love doing. I love being able to um, just change someone's fortunes or set, change someone's um, you know, opportunity. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm always pretty excited. Now, you mentioned you live in Warrigal, which is in Gippsland, which is actually quite a big corner of our state. Um, it's a it's very a whole corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we um, are profiling Gippsland quite heavily in the next issue, uh, both the travel, which is the the flip cover, but as well as Oak. And it's actually really nice. So again, looking at your data, Erica, we looked at all our sales data and knew that, you know, there's just this massive opportunity for us to, you know, tap into that area. We, we haven't shared any stories or, or connected with people there. And I want to ask you, what is... What do you, why do you love running a business from that little part of your region? 
Oh, that's a good question. Too. No, it's um, I love it here, and um, I think for me, I I I mean, I grew up um a little bit further down in Gippsland, and I always said I wouldn't go back. Not not that I had a horrible time, but you know, when you go off to uni and you're just like, see you later, country town. Yeah, um, your city mouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm off. I'm gone. Um, I think coming back um, was really um, was was quite terrifying, um, but very quickly I realised that working in a regional area means that you can really, really actually connect with people. It means that um, that you have the opportunity to, for me, and not for everyone, but I really feel like I have the opportunity to really help people and to be able to bring some of the perspective that I've gotten and some of the knowledge that I've gotten and to be able to come back in and, and apply that to this um, regional area. In the same way that I spoke about um, t- talking to people about your business, um, actually having an outsider's perspective of your town and your region and, um, and, and how to kind of promote yourself outwards uh, is really, really important. Um, I think the last couple of years during all those lockdowns and stuff really just cemented um, for me and my husband and my family, like how important it is um, for us to be in a community where we know people. Um, And I love that flexibility. I love that my kids, uh, everything's like five minutes away for me, my office, uh, the school, my house, the netball courts, the basketball, like everything's just so close. And and I know that, um, that there's always people uh, to, to kind of help out. Um, yeah, so businesses in, in the town that I'm in, um, there's a lot of business owners who have kids, for example, and we help each other out when there's a, a, a student free day and we've all got businesses to run so we can run little you know um, little child child mining services and rotate the kids around and I don't know like, I, was, I, I could there's a million reasons why I love working and living here and I don't know I guess I would never have done I would never have created this business if I'd stayed in the city I would have just kept um, working for other people and I would never have experienced um, what that's like and and I probably would have continued to you know commute an hour in the mornings and um, my kids would have gone to after school care and before school care and done all of that and yeah I don't know I just there is such opportunity in regional and rural areas I know that you know there are there are limitations there are tech issues and internet connection issues and the fact Mm. that sometimes your local post office is down the road (laughs) you know, 20 or 30K if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just hope that what we're doing, you know, with Oak and uh, the podcast but also the other magazines that are out there and the other little media platforms that are growing, um, that we're showing the possibility that there is mm. living in a rural area and a regional area and that we don't have to be, fr- yeah, we don't have to go to the city to be successful. I've got clients in the city. I've got clients in New Zealand and Queensland and, W, uh, you don't have to you don't have to be depending on what you do again but you you don't have to kind of um be in the place and work in the place that you are like that's a beautiful thing and I, I really think that's been one of the greatest silver linings out of what has been a pretty um you know horrendous couple of years but it's really demonstrated uh that the, the possibility and and if you look at the um huge um, movement to regional areas our my particular region is just people are just flooding in um, and that's been a, a direct result of of that pandemic and um, the realization that well if I'm going to work at home then do I want to work at home in a high-rise building or do I want to work at home you know on a on a with a backyard and you know a community and you know all trees and you know, all of that good stuff. Yeah. Just a little point there with how many people, I think is it 60,000 moved out into regional areas in Victoria, I think it was. Huge number. Yeah, it was. It was a massive number. Um, mm-hmm. 
like and they were going to come they were going to come like the the that sort of 2030 prediction um was there but but it really escalated that yeah, it was and, accelerated um, with Mm, COVID. Mm. The thing to look at it though also is that there are there is this whole new audience out there for you. So if you've been in business 20 years, you know, um, if you're a gym or something, there is a whole audience out there that have never heard you, that don't know your startup story, that don't know that, you know, oh, these are the two local people that own this business. There are people that aren't local, as we would usually consider a local, to that community yet. So, so much potential. Yeah. To, um, yeah. Introduce your brand via social. Mm, um, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Hmm. Now, to wrap us up, my favorite question uh, is always to ask Can you tell us about a friend of yours that we need to know about? It's really hard to pick someone, but I am going to pick uh, my friend Mish, Michelle Can, who, um, with her and her um, husband Dave, they have set up and run a stack of um, really great businesses over the years in, in Warrigal. Um, and they're just really creative and really generous with their time and energy to so many things. And I, I really feel like our local community benefits from them in, in so many ways that they would not even realise. Um, they've got a business because, yeah, they've got a business called String and Salt which is a cooking school and you probably you would have come across them. I have, yes. And, yeah, and they've got a, like amazing cooking school and they also have a shop that's full of um, lots, of, lots of cooking related stuff but also gifts and they've got like a kitchen appliances and stuff as well and um, and a business called Cleaver that um, makes these incredible uh, curing and salumi cabinets and, um, yeah, just just really, uh, they've just really exploded food and uh, they also have a spice business called Spice Oddity. Like they're just, they're just incredibly creative, wonderful, generous people who do really cool things. And, um, and Mish um, has... Uh, her own, a, a little business as well as you do when you have 20 million businesses um she's a triple threat she's also creative and artistic and she um anyone listening should check out her ceramics at stolen flower ceramics she makes just beautiful earrings and uh these gorgeous butter dishes and yeah just horribly talented and um really just just so such an important part of our um, community. And, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> you've mentioned one person, oh, like five like businesses, businesses or something. I know. Yeah. I know, <laughs> that's but that's the way the to thing. do it. <laughs> they've just got this whole, they're just so entrepreneurial, yeah. but so kind of like quiet and you wouldn't, you just wouldn't know. They're just really sort of humble and just awesome. So, yeah. yeah. I do think business ownership can be addictive. So you know, like starting new things. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely with those two. Actually, I think it's more Dave than Mish who likes to start all the businesses. Yep. Um, luck, luckily, uh, they've got a yeah, they've got good talents between them. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Well, um, I know it's been a very long time since we've been able to bring this together, uh, but we've got here. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's, it's an absolute awesome. pleasure. And I no doubt we'll see you, I reckon, in the next couple of months. Um, I yes. think I've made so many promises to Gippsland to come down. And, um, yeah, obviously we're featured in the Take Me Somewhere digital mag, um, which will be in print. But, yeah, I actually want to see some of these beautiful places and, um, yeah, just explore and, yeah, and meet people in real life. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great place to visit, you know. I mean, yeah, visit Gippsland, massive it's awesome. Definitely. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, thank you again. Worries. Thanks. Now, before you take off with all that inspiration and knowledge, we'd love for you to leave a review on our podcast so that we can continue to amplify women's voices in the media. And if you have any questions, we'd like to celebrate a win. You can always connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Oak Magazine AU. I'm so glad we've met and that now you know a friend of mine. <laughs>